Okay, so we are gonna discuss the interface reaction pattern here. We'll start out with lichenoid interface. In terms of the definition, you have a band-like lymphohistiocytic infiltrate in the upper dermis. You can see here in the lower image, this dense lymphocytic band-like inflammation obscuring the dermal epidermal junction. There's some areas of vacuolar change as well, which you often get with a lichenoid inflammation. The prototype for this is lichen planus. So this picture could be a lichen planus. You have hyperorthokeratosis overlying it, a wedge-shaped hypergranulosis, some sawtooth reedy ridges, and you have this nice dense band-like lymphocytic infiltrate. Vacuolar interface is a second type of interface. And this is definition, the definition of this is basal cell vacuolation. Um, and so with this vacuolization, you have hydropic change you have these little circles, these white vesicles that are forming inside of the keratinocytes. And the etiology of vacuolar interface is quite broad, so we'll discuss some examples of that. You're going to look for single cell keratinocyte apoptosis as well, which is very common. Here's a list of the causes of lichenoid dermatitis. I will not read this out loud to you, but it's here for reference, and we will hit on many of these entities in the lecture. And in terms of interface dermatitis, particularly encompassing both lichenoid and vacuolar, you have lichenoid here, but then interface including lichenoid and then additionally vacuolar interface change. So starting from erythema down, erythema multiform down here, um, these are all entities that you can see um, basal vacuolar change. So we'll go over these as well. Starting off with lichen planus, we all know that lichen planus often presents as little per, uh, peritic polygonal purple papules, and this is kind of a classic clinical presentation here, um, probably not even treated yet, and so this would be a really good biopsy to do to, to see classic lichen planus here. So you have these um, flat top polygonal papules, they're peritic, and they can occur in the oral region, genital, ocular, and even esophageal region. A picture of the oral involvement, oftentimes you will see these linear streaks that are forming a reticulated pattern, and this is typical of Wickham stria and lichen planus, and you can have um, changes that affect the nail plate as well. So the inflammation in lichen planus can affect the nail matrix, which causes nail dystrophy in this case. Another example from McKee's pathology textbook of a lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate. Here, the dermal epidermal junction is not as heavily obscured as the previous example. You can still trace out where the reedy ridges are, but you can see that they're taking on a sawtooth morphology. You can see from low power the band-like shape of that lymphocytic inflammatory infiltrate with scattered melanophages in the dermis. There are some areas where the lichenoid inflammation is interacting directly with the overlying epidermis, which is what you see. And if you cut deeper into this, you might actually find a more um, area of obscuring at this, at this portion. Overlying epidermis contains hypergranulosis that gets thinner in some areas and thicker in some areas, and that's the so-called wedge-shaped hypergranulosis. And then you have the overlying Peri, uh, hyperperikeratosis, rather. That's the typical um, structure of the uh, stratum corneum is a hyperorthokeratosis. You can have some focal perikeratosis and you can have some eosinophils and a lichenoid inflammation, which would make you think more about a lichenoid drug eruption. But the pure classic typical lichen planus usually lacks significant eosinophils and usually lacks significant perikeratosis. Higher power shows you these degenerating keratinocytes and formation of these colloid bodies, very eosinophilic um, proteinaceous material that's right or along the basement membrane. You see that interaction with the dense lichenoid lymphocytic inflammation, obscuring that basement membrane. And I do want to point out that it's normal to have some spongiosis overlying that lichenoid inflammation, but when you have such a dense lichenoid pattern, you should be thinking about lichenoid inflammatory pattern as opposed to spongiotic change. On DIF, you're gonna see that cytoid bodies are positive for IgM more often. 
and even sometimes IgG, IgA, and C3. And if you stain for fibrinogen on immunofluorescence, you'll oftentimes find a shaggy fibrinogen pattern. I will say that it's not uh, critical to have a DIF to make the diagnosis of lichen planus. However, it can be helpful in, um, in helping to separate from other autoimmune bullous dermatitis that can present similar to lichen planus, even on H&E, or if you've got a bullous lichen planus, it's good to just rule out autoimmune um, reactivity. If you have a single lesion that is presenting um, as a scaly erythematous papule, um, it can present anywhere on the body. The classic chest is 40 to 60 year old adult on the face, neck and chest. It can look like a basal cell carcinoma in many ways. It can be um, a benign lichenoid keratosis. And on histology, these are actually gonna look very um, similar to a basal cell carcinoma in many ways. And so what happens is you biopsy this area and you get an identical histology to lichen planus on H&E. So that really helps um, confirm the diagnosis. And it helps the patient too, because um, they don't have a malignancy and you're able to prove that to them. So um, if there's any suspicion, definitely just biopsy these. We'll get into the pathology of, um, we're skipping over the pathology of benign lichenoid keratosis because it looks exactly like lichen planus. Moving on to another entity called lichenitidis. This rash usually develops in children and young adults where you have numerous tiny papules. They're usually asymptomatic and mildly pyritic and they're on the arms, chest, and abdomen as well as the genitalia of patients. You can see these really monomorphic light colored papules. So the histology of lichenitidis involves a lymphohistiocytic infiltrate. It's usually a ball of inflammation in the dermis. It's interfacing with the overlying epidermis, which can be pretty atrophic actually. And then you have these reedy ridges that are elongating on the sides of that ball. And so this is the so-called ball and claw morphology of lichenitidis. Just a higher power view showing the lymphohistiocytic inflammation. And moving on to lichen striatus. So lichen striatus presents as a, usually a linear plaque in kids, as you see here to the right. It can occur in any age, often in children, affects the limbs and the neck as scaly papules or linear papules and plaques. Usually it follows Blaschko's lines of development and it can be self-limiting. It doesn't always require any treatment. There can be seasonal variation as well, more often um, occurring in the summer or the spring. Here is a picture of lichen striatus where you have this dense um, lichenoid inflammation. Again, it looks very similar to lichen planus. The key though, in this diagnosis is going to be finding inflammation around the eccrine glands. Erythema dyschromicum perstans. So this is uh, also known as ashy dermatosis found in Latinos and Asians, as well as young adults and kids. You have gray macules, which can coalesce, small little macules coalescing into larger plaques on the trunk, proximal extremities, face, and neck. Erythema dyschromicum perstans, uh, again, this ashy dermatosis can present with a mild basal to lichenoid vacuolar interface change. Um, so it doesn't have to, to be that inflamed actually. And in fact, it can be pretty subtle, so you have to really look at the clinical to be able to make that diagnosis. But ideally, you'll want to see some mild lichenoid or um, superficial perivascular lymphocytic inflammation. You'd like to see some pigment incontinence, which gives it that color of ashy uh, gray on clinical. You'll want to see cytoid bodies, some areas of hydropic degeneration of the basal layer or cell swelling. And you can even see some overlying hyperkeratosis, but not typically a lot of acanthosis of the epidermis. Just a, a repeat slide to show you vacuolar interface entities, which we, we will discuss. Urethema multiform is a classic you need to know. So on clinical, you have your target-shaped papules and, and macules. Usually it occurs in adults, 20 to 40s, but it can occur in any age, depending on the clinical scenario. 
you'll get targetoid lesions that occur in crops, often on the acral surface. Spring and summer just happen to be more common for erythema multiform. Erythema multiform is more of a reaction pattern, but it can be associated with herpes simplex virus infections, as well as mycoplasma, pneumonia infections, and many other drugs too, including antibiotics, oral contraceptive pills, and many, many others. So um, making the diagnosis of erythema multiform is going to be a association of that really classic targetoid appearance, but sometimes um, it's not 100% uh, classic on clinical, and there might be some faint uh, dusky areas in the middle with, um, you, you know, a little bit of a concentric lighter pattern. And so doing a biopsy to, to truly look and make sure it is an interface dermatitis can be very helpful. And so we will look at the uh, histology here. So this is what you're going to see. I'll move on to the picture first to show you. Um, so you'll have this really nice confluent basal vacuolar interface change. You'll have some scattered dyskeratotic keratinocytes. Um, the stratum corneum or much of the stratum corneum is going to be acute basket weep, which suggests that you do that this is more of an acute process. Um, more examples of the basal vacuolar change that you can see, some scattered dyskeratotic cells, just some more examples here. Um, and th in this case, you actually have a lot more epidermal generation, um, and you can see more dyskeratotic keratinocytes as well. And I like this picture because you can actually see a gradient from the outer edge to the inner edge where you have some uh, interface and dyskeratosis, but as you go to the right, you're going to see even more epidermal necrosis. And here it actually lifts off a little bit. So it's kind of like a bolus erythema multiform. You see that um, almost pretty much full thickness necrosis here at the, at the center part. But this has um, got that gradient just to show you that it's erythema multiform. And it has an overlying nice basket weave stratum corneum on it to tell you it's an acute process. So going back to a summary of what you're going to see, you'll look for that acute stratum corneum, which just means you have preservation of the basket weave orthokeratosis, vacuolar interface and dermatitis. You've got individual necrotic keratinocytes above the basal layer, which may progress to confluent epidermal necrosis in some areas, especially in that dusky center of the clinical lesion. You have cell death that's typically out of proportion to the lymphocytes. And like I showed you in that later picture, in late stage, you can have bulla or reepithelialization if the bulla has ruptured and it's a healing lesion. Related to this is toxic epidermal necrolysis or Stevens Johnson syndrome. So typically, TEN or SJS results from severe drug reactions, but it can be associated with many different things, including infections as well as autoimmune disease and, and other entities, but typically it's a severe drug reaction. Clinically, the lesions are very pyritic. You get bola, you get erosions. And in fact, if the patient is feeling extreme skin pain, even before you are seeing clinical lesions, that's a very worrisome sign to um, predict that they could be developing a toxic epidermal necrolysis or Steven Johnson syndrome. So clinically, if the patient's in a lot of pain, you should be following them very closely and um, taking any skin, any lesional skin and sending it to the lab to look for full thickness necrosis. The mucosa is usually involved in TEN or SGS, and it can be a multi-system um, disease process occurring all at once. This is widespread whole body inflammation in many cases. So how do you tell the difference between TEN and SGS? So TEN is really just 30% or more of the skin involvement, whereas SGS is less than 10%. So it's essentially both going to show you full thickness necrosis. In contrast to erythema multiforme, which is actually considered to be a slightly different molecular etiology as well, and pathophysiology, but um, EM is, like I said, not going to have complete full thickness necrosis throughout the whole lesion, and you're going to see a spatial gradient to that epidermal necrosis. So here is an example of that full thickness epidermal necrosis that you can see. Um, you see the top of the dermis, and then as you go up, it's just homogenized eosinophilic material, you can't really see any healthy keratinocytes here. And overlying it, you have an acute basket weave stratum corneum, which suggests 
a rapid process. Also notice really the lack of inflammation. I mean, there's not a ton of inflammation here. So a lot of the damage that's being done is soluble in, um, intermediates and um, molecular signaling without even a significant inflammatory component here. Usually the fast, fast ligand uh, signaling is involved with this process. Just more examples. So here you don't even have any dermis. You just got that sloughed off epidermis, the dying epidermis where there's just diffuse epidermal um, full thickness necrosis. There are some areas preserved here in parts of the um, epidermis, but this central part, this is more characteristic of full thickness. And if you have a wide uh, piece of skin that's showing that, then it's highly supportive of TEN or SGS. Moving on to poikiloderma. Oh, and I will say that um, treatment of T and SGS is pretty difficult. There's um, IVIG strategies, there's steroids, cyclosporin, um, even TNF alpha inhibitors. There's a lot of um, ideas of how you can treat it. Now, dermatologists typically don't like to debride these patients, but they often will get transferred to a burn unit because they're so their skin is so sensitive, and um, it's essentially that they're in such critical shape that they need that ICU care. Um, but the discontinuing of the potential culprit drug is key, although the damage is often already done and um, giving them any treatment you can to slow down or uh, attenuate the process is, is absolutely key to the patient's survival. Pricloderma is um, actually not a derm emergency at all, as opposed to TN or SJS. It's a descriptive term, clinical descriptive term. So you'll see um, in patients that have um, chronic sun exposure, you can have poikiloderma of savat. And so they've got this kind of chronic erythema in areas of sun exposure. You can see some slight scaling and some atrophy as well as variable pigmentation and telangiectasia overlying these areas. Um, now, this can be a feature of many different types of conditions, including even autoimmune conditions. So lupus and dermatomyositis, large plaque parasoriasis, um, and even genodermatoses can often present uh, with poikloderma. So if there are um, um, defects in DNA repair enzymes or uh, the way that the skin responds to UV radiation, Patients can present with more poikiloderma and Bloom syndrome and Cockane syndrome. We won't get into these genoderms for the sake of this lecture, but just understand that they can present with poikiloderma. And there's a rare entity as well known as DNA mitochondrial syndrome associated with poikiloderma, which we will not get into for the purposes of this lecture. So this is the most common poikiloderma, poikiloderma of Savat. You have photo, distribu photo distribution of the erythema on the sides of the face, the neck, the V of the chest, usually presents in middle-aged and elderly women. And there's a possible e uh, hormonal etiology to this, as well as phototoxic or photoallergic etiologies to perfumes and fragrances as well. Here is a picture of poikiloderma. You can just see some mild to moderate basal layer evacuation. You can see um, slight lymphocytic interface dermatitis as well. More examples of the poikiloderma change that you can see that basal layer of lymphocytic inflammation. Basal vacuolar change rather with not too much uh, lymphocytic inflammation. So this is a pretty subtle um, histopathology, but most of the time we do not biopsy it because it's just a clinical diagnosis, but this is what you'd be looking for if um, the rule out is poikiloderma. Moving on to GVHD or graft versus host disease. Usually um, the suspicion clinically is GVHD versus drug rash in patients that have had allogeneic bone marrow transplant, but also in patients that have had solid organ transplant. So you can have GVHD, uh, cutaneous manifestations of GVHD in the presence of both bone marrow and solid organ transplants. It can also be related to blood transfusion. And as GVHD is forming on the skin, also it can be a multi-system uh, process. You can have not only the skin, but also the liver, the intestine affected as well. 
the 2005 GVHD classifications um, are really built around trying to separate out acute GVHD versus late onset acute GVHD versus classic chronic GVHD and then some overlap symptoms. So <clears throat> the general um, guideline is to kind of see, okay, when was the bone marrow transplant? And so if it was before 100 days, um, it's probably an acute GVHD presentation. And if it was more than 100 days, but they don't have the symptoms of chronic GVHD, um, it could just be a late onset acute GVHD, persistent and recurrent or late onset acute GVHD. Classic um, GVHD, chronic GVHD is really kind of a regardless of timing from transplantation. You have chronic GVHD features without features of acute GVHD typically. And we'll talk about what you'd expect to see on histopathology um, when you're looking at acute GVHD versus chronic GVHD. And then you can have some overlap between acute and chronic GVHD, regardless of the timing of the transplant. So for acute GVHD, you're going to have sudden onset of fever and malaise, rapidly followed by cutaneous signs of facial erythema, a generalized morbilliform rash composed of macules and papules. Um, Palms and soles are typically involved. They can have mucosal lesions. It can look like toxic uh, epidermolysis necrosis or TEN, and unfortunately can have a high mortality if left untreated. So often if there's any evidence that it suggests this could be acute GVHD on histopathology, it's better to treat as such. Often it can look exactly like a morbilliform drug eruption, unfortunately. Um, and so clinical correlation is definitely essential, but leaving it untreated is definitely uh, far worse than, than uh, treating it empirically if you've got especially clinical and histologic evidence. Grading of acute graft versus host disease is usually split into four different grades. So for grade one, you just have focal or diffuse vacuolar alteration in the basal cells, and you can see... Um, a grade one here, you've got some focal basal vacuolar change, but not a lot of dyskeratosis here, just some basal vacuolar change. For grade two, you start to have more vo uh, vacuolar alteration of the basal cells, as well as some spongiosis and dyskeratosis of the epidermal cells, and even a corresponding dermal lymphocytic infiltrate. So here would be more of kind of a grade two, you can see better um, dyskeratosis, some surrounding spongiosis, some scattered dyskeratotic cells, and a pretty healthy inflammatory infiltrate as well. And for grade three, it starts to bump up even more. You've got formation of a subepidermal cleft in some areas in association with dyskeratosis and spongiosis. And grade four would be complete separation of the epidermis from the dermis. So here is kind of a grade two now, again, where you have, um, in compared to grade one, where you just have basal vacuolar change, Grade two, you've got more dyskeratosis. You've got larger basal vacuolar change areas. You have a denser lymphocytic inflammatory infiltrate. I will point out that there is a phrase called satellite cell necrosis, which is, um, it's kind of, it's not very specific for GVHD, but it's one of those buzzwords. And so um, just to kind of remind you all that satellite cell necrosis can be used to describe GVHD where you have um, necrotic keratinocyte with these kind of orbiting lymphocytes around it. They're, they're rotating around it like satellites in a way. But um, again, I would not rely on this to make the diagnosis. I would rely on the clinical scenario and the inflammation pattern, which is basal vacuolar change and um, dyskeratotic cells, et cetera. So chronic GVHD can actually look like lichen planus. So you can have a lichenoid GVHD. You can have a sclerodermoid GVHD where it looks a lot like scleroderma, both in even aligning on histopathology like that. So early chronic GVHD can look like lichen planus and later chronic GVHD can look like sclerodermoid changes um, where you just really have a dermal sclerosis. You've got loss of... Um, appendages like such as hair follicles and eccrine glands and it really does look like um, it really does look like scleroderma on biopsy as well and clinically now chronic gvhd can arise de novo or after acute gvhd you have system, uh, systemic changes 
as well. So hepatitis, bronchiolitis obliterans, you can have diarrhea, opportunistic infections. So these are all extra signals that the patient is having a, an episode of, or is having uh, symptoms of chronic GVHD. So here is an example of a lichen on GVHD. You've got some sawtooth reedy ridges. Now the band-like lymphocytic inflammation can be higher up as more typical of lichen planus, or it can start to kind of fade with more uh, homogenization here of the dermis and um, the lichenoid inflammation being situated a little bit lower as it regresses down. But overlying the epidermis here, you have this kind of hyper um, orthokeratosis and wedge-shaped hypergranulosis. You've got the basal vacuolar change and the areas of lichenoid interface change, or at least a uh, lymphocytic interface reaction. Dyskeratotic cells, you have um, scattered melanophages as well. So this, this is kind of like a, a lichen on GVHD picture. And here you can even see a lower power view of that where you have more um, upper dermal lichenoid lymphocytic inflammation. In, in, the, in the lower dermis actually here in this patient, you've got a pretty posse cellular or low density um, dermis with a lot of thick hyalinized collagen bundles. And so this is kind of where you're getting your more sclerotic change here. So in the late stage, you'll have more fibrosis and sclerosis. You'll have a loss of adnexal structures such as hair follicles and eccrine glands. And you'll have some areas that are reminiscent of scleroderma. Just to compare, erythema multiforum and GVHD can look very, very similar. And so you definitely have to rely on clinical scenario. So if the patient doesn't have a transplant, you know it's not GVHD. If the patient's got satellite um, lesions, it's probably EM and not GV, GVHD. So definitely relying on the clinical is going to be helpful. But if you were only made to choose EM versus GVHD with these images here, you can expect that the classic erythema multiform is going to have more necrotic keratinocytes predominating um, and less satellite cell necrosis. And you're going to also expect maybe a little bit more perikeratosis and satellite cell necrosis in uh, GVHD. But this is definitely not going to be um, very helpful in real life. You're going to have to um, go back to the clinical. So the point of this slide is really just to show you that there's a lot of similarities between EM and GVHD, and you really have to go to the clinical scenario, uh, if at all possible, to make it. It's, it's okay to sign it out as, if you have no clinical information, it's okay to sign it out as a vacular interface change with dyskeratotic keratinocytes and list your differential diagnosis um, based on clinical scenario. Pitteriasis lichenoides is a family of um, entities here that encompasses on one end of the spectrum, an entity called PLEVA, which stands for Pitteriasis lichenoides et variolaformis acuta. And on the other end of the spectrum, Pitteriasis lichenoides chronica. So if someone says Pitteriasis lichenoides without putting acuta or chronica at the end, it's just referring to the spectrum of disease. Essentially, um, this inflammatory reaction pattern can occur in older children and young adults, especially PLEVA. It presents as recurrent crops of papules to crusted vesicles. You can have necrotic ulcerations in PLEVA, and if, along with systemic symptoms, that's going to be called Mucha Haberman disease. As the lesions devolve into more of a chronic um, inflammatory state, they can be just gain more superficial scale and not as uh, ulceronodular, as you're going to see in PLEVA. The lesions can present at different stages. They can be on the trunk and upper extremities, and um, typically they're going to present in the upper part of the body more than the lower extremities. Here are your classic examples of the way PLEVA looks on histo. So you see these well circumscribed, kind of ulcerated papules to nodules on the skin in a young person on the arms. And pitteriasis lichenoides chronica, as I mentioned, are usually flatter papules with a little bit of overlying scale. And this is as the inflammation starts to die down, it's not going to be as impressive both histologically and clinically. So pitteriasis lichenoides, the common 
themes that you're going to see in both PLEVA and PLC are going to be uh, perikeratosis and spongiosis, basal vacuolar change with dyskeratotic keratinocytes, foci of extravasated erythrocytes, a lymphocytic infiltrate, and it's important to remember the epidermal changes are more prominent in PLEVA than PLC. So we'll show some examples of this. So I'll go back to this slide, but you can see this example of PLEVA and it's zoomed in on the basal layer. It's zoomed in on the basement membrane area where that interface is really dense. And so you have a pretty widespread basal vacuolar change with uh, underlying lymphocytic inflammation. You've got scattered dyskeratotic cells, some areas of extravasated red blood cells. It would be impossible to make the diagnosis just on this one screenshot here, but just to show you how robust the interface change can be. The histologic features of PLEVA, I like to think in terms of the acronym PLEVA. So P stands for perikeratosis, L stands for lichenoid to vacuolar interface change, E stands for erythrocyte extravasation, V stands for V-shaped lymphocytic infiltrate or vasculitis with a lymphocytic infiltrate around it. And so this isn't your classic neutrophilic or leukocytoclastic vasculitis. It's just referring to lymphocytic inflammation around the vessels. And you'll see extravasated red blood cells, which makes which gives it a lymphocytic vasculitis picture. And A stands for apoptotic keratinocytes or acute surface change where you've got scale and crust and ulceration, particularly more so in PLEVA. Eosinophils are not usually present in this entity showed you this picture already, so I'll move to the next one. You can see um, PLEVA has oftentimes that perivascular lymphocytic inflammation, some areas of extravasated red blood cells. As you progress from PLEVA to PLC, um, the inflammation dies down. So you still have these um, key uh, histopathologic findings, such as perikeratosis and vacuolar interface or lichenoid interface change. You've got dyskeratotic keratinocytes. You have perivascular inflammation with some foci of extravasated red blood cells. But in terms of the magnitude of the inflammation, it's not that much. And clinically, these are not going to be uh, as, as likely to be ulcerated. They're just going to have some scale on top, and they're going to be a little bit flatter as well. So compared to PLEVA, you've got a robust inflammatory infiltrate. Um, PLC is not as robust. And just to zoom in, you still have um, in PLC a, a nice recognizable lymphocytic interface dermatitis here. Moving on to fixed drug eruption. So this is the classic appearance of fixed drug eruption where you have this really well demarcated erythematous almost patch, but it's um, oftentimes presenting as a plaque. It's, it can be brown depending on when you biopsy it. If it's uh, more of a later stage inflammation, it can start turning brown with uh, hemosiderin, uh, making its uh, appearance known clinically. And so we'll discuss um, the histopathology of, of why you see the, um, the uh, hemosiderin and uh, how it indicates a recurrent inflammatory process, which is essentially what this is. So Fixed drug eruptions happen in areas at the same site with repeat use of the drug. And so these patients will present and say, you know, I get the rash in the same spot every time. What causes fixed drugs? So usually you want to think about sulfonamides, tetracyclines, NSAIDs. There's a non-pigmented form of fixed drug, and that's caused by pseudoephedrine. I don't usually see this, but it's uh, something that's been tested on traditionally. So on histology, you're going to see usually an acute basket weave stratum corneum, which suggests it, it came on rapidly. You'll find an interface reaction pattern composed of lymphocytes with overlying basal vacuolar change. Um, it doesn't have to be a dense lichenoid interface. It can be more of the scattered vacuolar lymphocytic interface change. And you can find some areas of dyskeratotic keratinocytes. Hopefully, you will find eosinophils within the dermis. That's going to signify a more of a drug reaction component to this, and you'll find scattered melanophages as well. So coupling the clinical appearance with this histologic picture, it all fits for fixed drug. So moving on to what you're going to find, just as a summary, you'll look for that acute basket weave stratum corneum. You can see papillary dermal fibrosis as well in many entities of fixed drug. 
and look for that um, melanin pigment incontinence. It can also have some hemocytorin um, pigment incontinence. It's typically, and, and I think I misspoke early on the previous slide, um, but you can have a mix of uh, melanin and hemocytorin, but oftentimes it's melanin pigment that's dropping out from the overlying epidermis. Um, now, if there's any question in histology of whether or not something's melanin or hemocytorin, usually hemocytorin is more of a golden, shiny brown pigment, whereas melanin is a deeper, darker brown pigment. And you can do a Fontana Masson to highlight melanin uh, pigment black. So you can do a Fontana Masson special stain and it'll highlight melanin pigment black. If you do a Prussian blue slash iron stain, you can highlight hemocytorin blue. So uh, I've had cases of blue nevi before where it looked like it could be hemocytorin or it could be melanin. I just went ahead and did the stains and made sure it was melanin and not hemocytorin there. Prominent vacuolar change with um, dyskeratotic keratinocytes in all levels of the epidermis can be seen. And you're going to want to look for a mixed infiltrate with eosinophils. So any classic uh, testable teaching example should contain eosinophils because that's going to be the most classic presentation a fixed drug. Now, depending on when you biopsy it, if it's um, starting to calm down, you may have less and less eosinophils at the time of the biopsy. So getting a fresh biopsy is going to be very helpful. Um, usually if the lesion is 24 to 48 hours old, you should be able to capture a good amount of eosinophils. Now, eosinophils are rare to absent in pteriasis lichenoides as well as other um, lichenoid interface reactions you can um, usually expect to see GVHD and lupus erythematosus as well as dermatomyositis not having a lot of eosinophils. I went over this picture with you already. All right, so getting into our autoimmune connective tissue disease to finish up the lecture, we'll start with lupus. So lupus is a very complex disorder. Lupus erythematosus, if someone says lupus erythematosus, you really need to think about it in terms of cutaneous lupus and systemic lupus. And so patients can have cutaneous lupus only without systemic involvement. They can have systemic lupus without cutaneous involvement. They can have systemic lupus with both cutaneous and systemic involvement. It just kind of depends on the patient and the presentation and the clinical scenario. Um, the subtypes of cutaneous lupus include chronic discoid lupus, which occurs mostly isolated in the skin, but can co-occur with the development of systemic lupus, often in about 15% of patients eventually. Systemic lupus, rather, is a multi-system disease. It's a clinical diagnosis in which they have um, usually positive ANA, autoantibody titers. They have photosensitivity, joint pains, neurologic changes, hematologic changes, you know, um, the list goes on and essentially rheumatology is going to do the checklist to make sure that they fit all the clinical criteria for systemic lupus. Um, a, a biopsy showing cutaneous lupus is actually not required to make the diagnosis of lupus. It's a clinical diagnosis. Subacute lupus erythematosus or subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, oftentimes uh, mentioned in abbreviation as SCLE. Um, these are distinct cutaneous lesions. They'll present often as annular cutaneous lesions. They can look a little bit like granuloma annulari, but with some scale on it. And these are sometimes associated with mild systemic illness. They're really often associated with drug-induced phenomenon. So if a patient presents with subacute lupus, you want to look for a culprit drug causing it. But the inflammatory pattern looks very similar to um, other types of cutaneous lupus, which we'll discuss. So moving on to discoid lupus, it's a prototype of um, interface um, autoimmune connective tissue disease. It's the most common form of lupus. It occurs more in females than males at a ratio of two to one. The peak incidence is in the mid thirties. Usually it occurs on sun exposed sites, particularly the head and neck. You have scarring of scalp lesions, which results in permanent alopecia. So here you see these kind of grayish, well demarcated indurated plaques with some um, scale. And there can be some follicular prominence as well. And that is a result of follicular plugging, which we'll get into on the histopath. This is a discoid lupus in a type two patient, type two Fitzpatrick patient. And so you see this very erythematous, well demarcated 
indurated plaque with some overlying scale. So what are you gonna look for in discoid lupus erythematosus? I'll skip to the picture and then I'll go back to the summary slide here. So the picture is gonna show um, widespread basal vacuolar interface change. You're gonna see some epidermal atrophy, many areas of follicular plugging. You'll see increased dermal mucin, you'll see a thickened basement membrane, and you'll see a superficial and deep perivascular and perifollicular and periecrine inflammation. So if you see superficial and deep peri vascular and periadenexal inflammation with increased mucin, these interface changes, it's pretty classic for discoid lupus. And you'll want to make sure that that's what the clinician was thinking um, because it, it would be perfect to fit into that. And to summarize uh, what I just said, you will have um, vacular interface with basal vacuolation and dyskeratotic keratinocytes. This is going to be classic. Superficial and deep lymphocytic inflammation around the pilosebaceous units as well as the vessels. Dermal mucin increased, thick and basement membrane, follicular plugging and hyperkeratosis, and atrophy of the epidermis, particularly atrophy in the stratum spinosum. Here is just a higher power view to show you that um, basement membrane, uh, vacular interface change, some underlying lymphocytic inflammation areas of that thickened basement membrane and follicular plugging. Now, increased spaces in between the collagen bundles typically will correlate with increased mucin, but if you want to prove it, you can do um, alcium blue or you can do colloidal iron stains, which stains for mucin. On higher power, you see uh, this is an example of discoid lupus, again, with the thickened basement membrane here is this homogenous eosinophilic material, material right under the basal layer keratinocytes which have pretty prominent basal vacuolar change. Another example of that thickened basement membrane, in this case, even more noticeable. A tumid lupus is essentially, it can look like discoid lupus, but without those overlying epidermal changes. So it's predominantly a dermal inflammatory pattern. And it's, uh, it's really uh, exemplified by the superficial and deep perivascular and periadenexal inflammation with increased dermal mucin. It's more of a chronic form of lupus. There's a low incidence of subcutane or of a systemic lupus. However, there are cases of tumid lupus presenting with systemic lupus. Um, these patients, or when these uh, lesions resolve, they actually result in no scarring as opposed to discoid lupus. So they don't affect the basement membrane here. And so they don't result in scarring. Usually the, the clinical lesions are edematous plaques with minimal to no epidermal change, typically on the face of sun exposed areas. Again, I mentioned the superficial and deep lymphocytic infiltrate, increased stromal mucin. And if you do have any um, overlying epidermal change, you're just gonna have mild focal vacular interface change. If you have some significant change, you should be thinking about a discoid lupus. Just an example to show you the increased interstitial mucin in the dermis with perivascular lymphocytic inflammation. Again, uh, in this case, you see just a very striking increase in epidermal mucin. Moving on to subcutaneous, uh, subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus or SCLE. This is that annular erythematous rash that occurs in patients that may or may not have systemic lupus. It may just be a reaction pattern to a drug. However, you do get interface dermatitis, and that's why we're discussing it here. And you also have a strong association with an anti rho antibody in many cases. So SCLE occurs more in females than males. It typically presents around the age of 40 years old in sun-exposed areas. It can be symmetric and non-scarring. It can be non-indurated and erythematous. Again, the strong anti rho antibody association is the more um, high yield testable uh, factoid, as well as it's helpful when you are suspecting it clinically to get a biopsy and maybe do the uh, anti rho lab test as well. Now, in discoid lupus, you're going to expect, um, you're going to uh, expect differences between discoid lupus and SCLE. So, SCLE more than discoid is going to have atrophy and vacular interface change with dermal edema and mucin. It's going to have more of those in DLE, but it's going to have less hyperkeratosis, follicular atrophy, and basement membrane, basement membrane zone thickening as compared to discoid. So 
it makes sense too, because clinically discoid looks like it would be more hyperkeratosis. You're going to see more what we call carpet tacking sign clinically, which is uh, corresponds with that follicular atrophy. And so that's why you're going to expect SCLE to have less of those things than DLE. But SCLE can definitely have a good amount of atrophy and vacular interface, as well as dermal edema and mucin. Still, without the clinical morphology description, it's going to be very difficult to tell definitively discoid versus SCLE. So you have to have the clinician keying you in and hinting, hey, I'm suspecting uh, SCLE here in this annular rash. It's also important to track down maybe a culprit medication that might be causing SCLE. So terbinafine is, a, is one that comes to mind as a common medication that we prescribe for onychomycosis, but patients can actually have a SCLE-like reaction pattern. Here's an example of what I just mentioned, where you can have atrophy, vacular interface change, you can have increased dermal mucin, all within the uh, SCLE pathology, but you don't have as much follicular plugging here. You don't have hyperkeratosis. Um, and so you actually don't even have a significant superficial and deep um, inflammation and subcutaneous lupus uh, erythmat or sub subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus more often than not. So this is a kind of a classic low power view of SCLE. As you go on higher power, you see this um, pretty prominent vacular interface change with overlying dyskeratosis, underlying lymphocytic inflammation, some increased terminal mucin. You don't really see a thickened basement membrane here, so that can help you if, you're, if, you're, if you have no clinical information whatsoever. Finishing up with dermatomyositis. So dermatomyositis, as we know from our medical school years, uh, is often characterized by a rash with proximal muscle weakness, but you don't always have to have muscle weakness. In fact, you can have amyopathic dermatomyositis. So it's really more of a um, autoimmune connective tissue disease in a way. And um, the biopsies are gonna demonstrate a vacular interface change with increased dermal mucin. Unfortunately, it can be pretty subtle on biopsies. So you really have to have a strong clinical suspicion of dermatomyositis to key in the pathologist to look for some of these subtle changes. But I have seen some really good examples of biopsies of some of the classic uh, rashes, such as the um, shawl sign around the, the chest, um, heliotrope rash, which is periorbital edema, and um, the Holter sign, which is on the side of the legs, on the, on the lateral side of the legs, um, where you have just very impressive vacular interface change and increased dermal mucin, which is pretty classic for dermatomyositis. So um, other things with dermatomyositis, typically the erythema involves the face, the dorsal hands, the chest, the upper back, and the extensor extremities. And nobody's going to forget about the classic gut trends papules that occur on the dorsal hands of patients with dermatomyositis. Unfortunately, patients with dermatomyositis may have an association with malignancy. And so there is a type of dermatomyositis that's associated with malignancy. These patients often have anti-TIF1 gamma autoantibodies as well, which is something you can test for. And uh, if they have the anti-TIF1 gamma and they have dermatomyositis, you should definitely be trying to rule out some type of um, primary malignancy. As I said, dermatomyositis on histopath presents with vacular interface with few dyskeratotic and apoptotic keratinocytes. You can have a sparse superficial perivascular infiltrate. You can also have basement membrane zone thickening, uh, similar to discoid as well. And you can have increased uh, interstitial mucin. You can see how subtle this uh, biopsy is of dermatomyositis. You've got some kind of a whitish appearance to the dermis. Um, so it's kind of increased dermal mucin here. You have some basal vacular change, which is a little patchy and intermittent. Um, maybe a little bit of epidermal atrophy as well. Maybe a little bit of dermal fibrosis in the superficial papillary dermis. But if you had no clinical information here, it'd be um, impossible to call it dermatomyositis. But with this vacular change here, um, you should definitely be suspecting it. And with increased dermal mucin as well. Just another example of the um, vacular interface change. You can have a little bit of overlying spongiosis, some scattered dyskeratotic cells, and then more prominent um, interstitial mucin here, which appears more of just widened spaces between the collagen. 
So you can do confirmation uh, mucin stains to really highlight that. And unfortunately, it is um, a little difficult sometimes without the clinical to tell cutaneous lupus versus dermatomyositis. However, there are some helpful hints. So with lupus, you'll usually see a superficial and deep infiltrate. That's probably going to signal to you that you're dealing with more of a lupus, whereas in the dermatomyositis, you're usually only going to see a superficial inflammation. And um, on direct immunofluorescence uh, for lupus, you're going to find a full house uh, of the DIF on the DIF. So you'll have IgA, IgM, uh, Ig, you'll have IgG, IgM, IgA, and you'll have C3. Um, usually forming a linear lupus band, as they call it, but you don't always have to have it. And it can be uh, falsely positive in uh, chronic sun exposed patients. It can be falsely negative in patients. And so you have to really kind of couple it all with the um, clinical scenario and gather as much information as possible. Now, uh, here we have that dermatomyositis often has a negative DIF. However, there are some um, dermatopathologists that have found a role for the C5 to C9 membrane attack complex, particularly in uh, DIF patient or in DIFs of, uh, from patients with dermatomyositis. So, so there could be a role for looking for C5 through C9 membrane attack complex in dermatomyositis. So just to show you the similarity here, uh, on the left, you have an acute lupus with a basal vacuolar change. And on the right, you have uh, dermatomyositis with very similar looking basal vacuolar change and some increased mucin here. So um, it can be pretty difficult to tell the difference without clinical information. All right, well, that is going to be it for our um, interface dermatitis. And uh, for the next lecture, I'll, I'll record vesicular bullous diseases um, since it is a topic that requires much attention. And hopefully you all will be able to um, self-study the interface dermatitis reactions and be able to make the diagnosis when you get your clinical information. So thanks for your attention.